Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. You are going to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the director of a new art center speaking to a group of local people who have come to hear what the new art center will be offering. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for turning out on this cold, wet evening. Welcome to our new art centre. I'm delighted that so many people are interested in finding out about the facilities and events that we'll be offering. I'll start with the regular evening events that we've scheduled so far. Sunday night will be film club night. Each week we'll be showing a classic film from the 40s, 50s or 60s. Films will start at quarter to seven and afterwards there will be an opportunity to discuss the film in the cafe bar for anybody who'd like to. Tickets for the film will be £5, but the discussion afterwards is free. Although anybody who wants to buy me a drink is welcome to do so. <laughs> On Thursday evenings at 7.30, the auditorium is given over to productions by touring theatre companies. This coming Thursday, we're very excited to be welcoming Pizzazz, a drama company featuring both able-bodied and physically handicapped actors. They'll be performing a rather special version of William Shakespeare's The Tempest, featuring music and dance, as well as dialogue. Fridays and Saturdays will be music nights, starting at 8pm, with classical or traditional music on the Fridays and pop rock on the Saturdays. However, as the sound system hasn't yet been fully installed, these events won't be starting for another few weeks. As well as evening performances, various events will take place during the day. So far, a mother's and toddler's session has been arranged for Monday afternoons, and of course, anybody can drop in for a coffee or a sandwich. The cafe bar will be open from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Mondays to Fridays and 11 a.m. to midnight Saturdays and Sundays. Lunch will be served from half past 12 till 2 and light snacks will be available all day. Of course, this programme is just the start and we expect to be announcing many additional events in the near future. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about becoming a member. Membership benefits include reduced price tickets, priority bookings and a monthly newsletter, which will feature the latest details of forthcoming events, plus details of other arts events in the local area. The cost of membership is just £15 a year, which I think is very reasonable. To get a membership card, you'll need to provide us with a passport-sized photo, plus payment of course, by cash or cheque. We can't accept credit cards, I'm afraid, at least not for the moment. We hope to have credit card payment facilities available in the not-too-distant future. Then, when you want to buy reduced price tickets, you simply show your card at the box office or quote your membership number if you're making a telephone booking. 
Generally, a membership card will save around 20% on the full ticket price, so it really is very good value. Now we come to the most important part, your suggestions. It's your art centre, so we want to hear what you'd like to see. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Jenna and Marco, discussing a business studies project they have to do. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 24. Come on, Marco. We've got to get on and sort out this project for Professor Buckley. Hang on. I want to make sure we've got all the information. Now, where are we? Well, today we need to sort out exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to divide the work up. OK. How long have we got, by the way? Um, the end of term is April 6th. And he said to hand it in on week 8, so that's March 25th at the latest, because the beginning of that week is the 21st, oh. so not long. Right. Have you got the notes there? Yes. He wants us to do a fairly small-scale study, like the last one, on whether or not businesses were offering more benefits to staff. Mm. And we've now got to look at the rise in older workers. It should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, as long as we keep it small. Mm. Who's marking it? I don't know. Sometimes he gets the PhD students to mark it for him. Oh, actually, it just says here, a senior lecturer. Mm. I suppose it's too much for Professor Barclay to do them all. Yeah. Anyway, how are we going to go about this? Well... We have to decide how big we want it to be and who... Yeah, we... but I think we must sort out a timetable for the project. Otherwise, nothing will get done. OK. Uh, do you want to do that? All right. I'll do it as soon as we finish here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. OK, what do we have to do now for the project? What's the best way to go about it? Um, well, Professor Carter suggested we set up a focus group to get some in-depth interviews, but I think that'll take a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. If we did a focus group, we'd have to spend time deciding who to include in it, and it's not necessary to do one anyway. Oh, fine. And if you agree, I think we should get in touch with the businesses on the list Professor Carter gave us and ask them if they're prepared to participate. Sounds good. Uh, then we can go there, give them questionnaires and collect them later. Exactly. OK. Then, do we need to book one of those study rooms in the library so we can work together to input the data? Perhaps not, as I guess just one of us could just sort it out, actually. Yes, that would be easier. A lot of what we're doing is qualitative, so it'll be writing up rather than statistics. No software for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I think it would look better if we had actual shots of some of the staff, because we're citing appearance as a factor in employability, aren't we? Yeah, OK. I'll factor that all in when I sort everything out tonight. I'm glad we decided to work together. I think it's going to work out well. Yes, well, given that we had to work in pairs on this project, I think we were right to choose each other. Hmm. We complement each other academically, as we're each good at what the other isn't. <laughs> in fact, we should have tried working together before. <laughs> yes. Now, how shall we split the work? I'll do the analysis, shall I? Oh, OK. It's just that it might be faster, because I'm used to doing it. Although your English is better than mine. I need more practice at reading, really. OK, I'll do the presentation then, if that's OK with you. Yeah, sure. I don't mind speaking in public, but I hate preparing all the notes for them. The thing is, the tutor said one person should do the whole presentation, and he said he expects me to do it because I haven't done one yet. No, that's fine. Now, let's see. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire and tsunami. The giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometres across and travelling at around 90,000 kilometres an hour slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporised in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about 4 kilometres deep and 40 kilometres in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 metre height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometres away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across, 
and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.